Good afternoon and welcome to the Public Works meeting for October 4th. Welcome and we are going to have Kim call the, or Cheryl call the roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councilmember Larimer? Here. Councilmember Cower? Here. Poor. Councilmember Fincher? Here. Thank you. You're all present and accounted for. Any changes to the agenda? No changes. Also with us, we have the Public Works Department Chair, De Department Director, Chad Barron. So, uh, ready for a motion to uh, for the approval of the minutes. Chair, I move to approve the agenda. The, the minutes? Or the minutes, sorry. <laughs> the minutes. Second for it September 20th, yeah. It has been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the September 20th meeting. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That has passed. And now we are on to business and we are going to have Drew Holcomb come on up and give us some information on the West Hill Reservoir. Hello, council members. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Drew Holcomb, and I'm here to give you an update on the uh, West Hill Reservoir that's currently being constructed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is some aerial images we have from our, our wonderful uh, multimedia staff who came out and used their drone to take some pictures during construction. So on the left here, there's a big hole, which is where we can put the foundation for the reservoir. And this is uh, going to be approximately 150 feet tall and 80 feet in diameter. And it's going to hold 5 million gallons of water to serve the West Hill, both domestically and to cover fire flows for any fires that may occur. And uh, in order to make sure that tank is stable, it needs a big foundation. So we excavated pretty much the whole site and put a lot of steel and concrete down there to keep this tank uh, standing. And you can see on the right, that was from the concrete pour. Uh, you can see all that dark uh, gray in the, in the foundation there is all steel. So there's a lot of rebar in there and then they filled all that rebar with concrete. So they lined concrete trucks up around the block and pumped for 12 hours. So there's quite a bit of concrete there keeping that tank upright. Um, oh, next slide. Uh, some more aerial images, and these are showing uh, the crane, which is, they were delivering steel that day, and they set up the crane uh, on the foundation there. And then on the right, that's uh, the storm drainage tank um, that's going to be serving all the storm drainage on site. We'll go through there. Uh, these three pictures show the exciting part of bringing the tank vertical. So you can see the crane is set up inside the tank there. And this crane is going to, they, they've currently got two rings, and they've, I believe they're starting the third this week or, or next week. But they're, th this all shows the first ring going in, and the, the crane is inside the tank. And it will construct the tank all the way up to its max, the crane's max height. And then they'll bring in a bigger crane and construct the top of the tank on the ground next to the tank and lift that on top, all with this crane in there. And then once the tank is finally all assembled, they'll drive that crane out, out of the tank through that gap that you see there. So that kind of gives you a sense of how the construction of this tank is going. Um, the project is on schedule. And they're going to be continuing to erect steel and weld through the fall and winter of 2021 slash 2022. And as I described, the topping off of the tank will likely happen in spring of September 2022 with completion in the fall of 2022. And in, in order to complete the tank, they have to put the coatings on there and, and do all the testing and everything. And in addition to the coatings, we're going to be painting a mural on the tank. So. I brought with me uh, Matt here, Matt Coy. Uh, do you want to introduce sure. yourself? We'll go to the next slide there. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Coy. I work with Drew in Public Works Engineering. Um, I will be assisting with the mural portion of this project, and along with the construction updates, we thought it was a, a good time to tell you a little bit about the process and kind of where we're at and fill you in, uh, in some of the details. So 
Last month, we advertised a proposal request uh, to see if we could get some interest from artists and mural companies to uh, paint, the, paint the mural on the tank. Um, and based on that, the response we got from that, we were able to identify a company called the Artist Brothers. Uh, they are local to Spokane, and they do a lot of work um, on similar projects. Um, they have recently completed projects for uh, Bellevue and also uh, Sammamish Plateau Water. So with that, uh, a little bit about the, the design process. What we are going to do is require the artist to develop three renderings, much like you see on the left side of your screen up here, um, and present those to the city. Uh, what the city is then going to do uh, is put together a selection committee um, based upon or with staff from mayor's office, uh, public work design, operations, parks, and also ECD. From there, the selection committee is going to review the three designs. They're going to pick their favorite. They're going to provide input and feedback based upon the design. We're going to take that feedback, work with the artist to incorporate all the elements that the committee would like to see, and come up with a, uh, a finalized design um, to put on the mural. So after that, the artist will present their final design, which we will then take to both the Arts Commission and the West Hill um, Council to get buy-off approval and maybe some any last-minute tweaks or, or uh, design changes that may need to happen last minute from, uh, from them. And from there, they install the mural on the tank and that represents the, the last step in the process. So kind of one interesting tidbit that I found interesting is it's a large tank, but it only takes them about two or three weeks to, to put the, the mural on to the, to the tank. So, yeah, most of the work is in the design. And so is it a like, giant wrap? It's actually paint. So they use a coating, um, a special coating that's kind of meant for, to hold up against the elements and, and provide pr not protection and functionality for the tank as well. Ensures a long lifetime. So the... Um as part of the contract of what they're constructing out there now, the contractor will put um, the same paint coating on the outside and they'll do it in three separate colors. And then we will hire this mural artist as a separate contract, as all part of this project, but a separate contract to come out and paint on top of that with the same paint that the contractor used. So it'll blend in with the color bases that they do. Okay. Is there a reason why you're not going to include any of the neighbors, like a neighborhood representative? with the uh, with the initial group that's being formed? We just wanted to keep it internal just to make it simpler. I mean, we're, we're happy to bring the options, and if they don't like the one option that we've presented, we'll, we'll, we can go look at the other ones. We just figured it would be easier to keep it internal with all those uh, key players. And from the Parks Department, we have uh, Rhonda Millercheck, who is also on the Kent Arts Commission, so we're, we're including them that way. Uh, but we'll also present it to them for final buy-off, of course. And speaking off of, off of Drew, Council Member Fincher, what we're thinking about doing is after we get that final design, there's going to be an opportunity for input from the Arts Commission and also West Hill to be able to say, hey, you know, we don't think that's going to work, but we are held within the guardrails of our conditional use permit, mm -hmm. which requires us to kind of have some sort of theme, but we want to make sure we get a product that everybody has you know, a chance to put their input in and make sure their their design elements are, are incorporated into it, so. Okay, and I knew there was a meeting coming up with them. I was just wondering why it was further down the road. Sure, sure. So, and I have enjoyed watching the project go up. You know, I have didn't get out there. I saw the rebar that they laid in there, and I saw the leap. I was out before they actually got it in there, so I saw it laying around, but very impressive watching it go up. Did you have questions um, comments? Just, yeah, kind of question and a comment. Um, with the the artist rendering, um, there's there's a large water tower in my neighborhood, and my complaint is that the sky is never it's too blue for a gray day, and it's not blue enough for a blue sky day. Mm -hmm. So I would say the more we can fill with trees and not have that issue of this weird gray that's never quite matching the sky, right, would yeah. be my suggestion. 
Right. It's just never quite right for any particular day. Right. Well, we'll, we'll take that into consideration, but unfortunately the tank is pretty tall and it's hard to get up there on a lift. So that kind of limits how high we can paint it on there. Mm. Uh, from a maintenance standpoint, if we have to have someone hang off the tank in order to touch that up, it makes it a lot harder to. True. Uh, and costly to maintain. But some of the that, booms they have are able to get to get pretty high, so we'll max them out. Per, pretty high, okay. yeah, but not oh. not all the way. Yeah. Based on our just our preliminary research, I'm not a painting expert, but <laughs> we'll uh, we'll keep that in mind. Maybe, maybe after this tank, we will be. But. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, my only other question was, yeah, the technique. So you answered that. So thank you. Yeah, uh, we were talking with the tank uh, contractor, and he said, you know, it's amazing. This guy just goes out there with a the roller and just rolls a little bit here and a little bit there. And then you're standing way back there, and you're like, oh, wow, how does he know yeah. what he's doing? But, you know, these guys have a lot of experience. So mm -hmm. Very cool. it'll be interesting watching that. Experience I do not, and talent I do not have. Yeah. Councilmember Core, any questions or comments? Um, no questions. My questions have been answered. Thank you, um, Councilmember Fincher. Um, I, I think it's a really cool process too, and I'm looking forward to the end product. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. All right. Thank All right. you. Thanks, Matt. And next, Drew is going to stick with us and going to talk about South 212, the preservation, 76. And I see we have a few different streets you're going to talk about, but. Yep, yeah, so this is the 212 Preservation Project, which is an overlay project, and we received $2.1 million in funding from PSRC to complete this overlay. Um, if you recall, last time I was talking to you at the Committee of the Whole, I brought good news that we got additional funding because this project was ready and they had extra funds to put to a project that can use it, and we were ready to go. So we lucked out and got some extra funds there, and they've been working on constructing that this summer. So. Um, you can see the project limits there on the screen. It goes from 72nd Avenue, where we recently completed a concrete intersection a number of years ago, to um, East Valley Highway or 84th Avenue. And we overlaid through the interurban crosses through there and then two railroad tracks. And uh, those green dots are where we did curb ramp improvements. Uh, this slide kind of shows what the pavement was like and why it needed an overlay. Um, you can see there's rutting on the right side and then a big truck on the left and some, some bad pavement there at the 70, 77th intersection. So here's a couple of photos from construction. Um, on the right, the top right there, that's a paving machine, so they're doing the overlay. Uh, but before we could do the overlay, you had to do on the bottom there, there's the two grind grinders. So they've got to grind the pavement and then they come back with the paving machine and overlay it. And uh, in the top uh, left corner, is some um, striping next to leading up to the railroads. Uh, I put a little before and after slide. It's not quite the same angle, but uh, this is the same intersection. So this is 77th, and you can see what it looked like before and what it looked like after. So it's much cleaner, and and you know it really made a difference there. And there's another truck in there. This road does get a lot of truck traffic, which is why it needed the overlay so badly. And here's a, a picture of the final product. Um, as I said, they're, they're mostly done with the project, but the railroad work was done a little later, so we're still waiting for that asphalt to cure before we can stripe that. But other than that, the project is pretty much uh, done. So everything went pretty well on that. Just wanted to give you an update. Uh, do you have any questions I can answer? Nope, looks good. Yeah, no, be I able to see it quite well. Yeah, I drive that route several times a week and really appreciate it. I was very excited the first time. Good, yeah. <laughs> Big difference. Yep, yeah, definitely. I mean, the railroad tracks are a lot smoother too, so pretty nice. Councilmember Core, anything? Uh, I just want to say I haven't been that way since uh, construction, but I'm very excited to drive on that road because I know it was in pretty bad shape before, so I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, just another update, we're working on a, an overlay on East Valley Highway. We're working on designing that in hopes to get additional grant funds and, and overlay some of the 212th and, and East Valley Highway going north. So that's uh, another project I'm working on. Good, good, good. Well, thank you very much, Drew. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from Laura. Information on the NPDES audit. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me today. Here we are. 
My name is Laura Heron and I work in environmental engineering and I oversee our compliance with the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permit or the NPDES Permit. And we did just currently go through an audit, so I'm going to talk to you about both the permit and our audit real quick. So the NPDES Permit is part of the Clean Water Act, which is overseen by the Environmental Protective Agency. And in the state of Washington, the Department of Ecology oversees the permit. We are a phase two municipal permit holder, which allows us to discharge water from our storm drainage system, the public one into waters of the state like rivers, streams, and creeks. And we are in a new permit. Under our last permit, we had six programs that we had to implement as well as other requirements. I'll go over these real quick. Public education and outreach, that's where we educate the public on pollution prevention. Public involvement and participation is where the public is involved with preventing pollution, like team up to clean up, or reviewing our stormwater management program and giving us responses and um, illicit discharge detection and elimination. This can be anything from a car accident where we know what happened, we know where the pollutant went, we know what it is, to doing in-depth um, investigations on let's say an illicit connection into our system, or we see a substance in our system or in a creek and we don't know what it is and we have to figure out what it is, how it got there, and any harm that it can do. And then we have to do reports on that and um, document them for ecology. And this is for any report we get, even if we don't find anything. Um, controlling runoff from new development, redevelopment, and construction sites is where we inspect construction sites to ensure that they're using the right best management practices to keep pollutants from leaving that site, whether it's sediment, or fuel or anything else that can happen on that site. Operations and maintenance are two different programs in one. There's the operations and maintenance inspection of our public system, which our public works ops crews work on. And there's also the inspection of private systems that discharge into our system. And we need to inspect them to make sure they're doing the proper operations and maintenance of their system so they're not putting pollutants into our system. Monitoring and assessment is monitoring for water quality. We do some in-house monitoring we also pay into a regional program to meet this requirement, but we are heavily involved with that regional program. We do sit on the technical advisory committees. We provide information and data and assess that data and help write reports. And this is to ensure that the NPDES uh, permit is actually working to prevent pollutants from entering into waters of the state. But under the new permit, which was released in August of, um, 2019, and it goes until July of 2024, we ended up with three new programs. And these permits are typically five-year permits. And with each new <laughs> permit that they implement, we end up with new programs we need to implement. So this time we have MS4 mapping and documentation. The MS4 is our public system. Source control program for existing development and comprehensive stormwater planning. And I'll get into these in more detail as I walk through our audit process that we went through. So we had a meeting with Ecology for the audit on July 28th. We met with Ecology and covered 18 permit requirements. We focused on the implement implementation of our new programs that I just went over, and we reviewed program implementation, reporting, and documentation. So I'll go through next the information that we gave them on these new programs. So the source control program, again, a new mandate, is a program where we need to identify businesses within the city of Kent that could possibly be pollutant generating or discharge pollutants into our system. So we figure from our current estimates that there'll be over 400 additional inspections per year. We are required to inspect 20% of these properties annually. So building source control site inventory. This is our TLT, Natisha Hutchison. She has been key player along with our other two inspectors in identifying the sites that we'll need to add into this inventory. So these inspections are going to be inspecting properties to ensure they're using the right best management practices to make sure that they're not, you know, through their processes, they're not putting pollutants into our system or waters of the states. So this one that you see up here now is one of the ones that is in our system for our inventory for this program. You can see that they have a mess on the asphalt from just cutting of the slabs. But not only that, they took their process water and put their discharge hose directly into our catch basin. And so we caught this. So we'll be working with these properties to work on programs internally so that they can still do their processes, but they won't be um, contributing to pollutants into our system. So this will be 
a lot of education and outreach involved in this. And, our, and also, our inventory is going to be fluctuating. Um, as businesses come and go from Kent, or as they change their processes, or as we identify more properties that are having processes that could produce pollutants, this will be fluctuating. So I was able to show Ecology a map of the ones we've identified so far and where they're located and what types of businesses they are so that they can see that we're working on this. And this is by parcel. So each one of those parcels could have multiple businesses within that parcel that are going to be part of this program. It could be um, a, you know, a business park. It could be a strip mall that has numerous businesses. But it gives them an idea of what we're working on. And then we have the comprehensive stormwater planning. Now, this isn't new to Kent. We've always done comprehensive stormwater planning. However, they want us to do a certain process, taking certain steps to create a stormwater management action plan. And this process is um, involved with the first step, identifying all of our um, basins within the city of Kent, and then determining the receiving waters from those basins, getting information on those basins, and determining which one of those basins might best benefit from some type of best management practice, whether it's structural, habitat restoration, more education and outreach, regional facilities, like the one you see down below, that one's at uh, Point Defiance. So I was able to show them that we've already delineated our basins and identified our receiving waters within those basins, and now we're collecting Kent-specific data so that we can prioritize these basins and determine which ones we want to focus on for our stormwater management action plan. Mapping and documentation, again, a new mandate. We've always mapped our system because we need it for inspection and maintenance and um, also for illicit discharges. We want to know if we have an illicit discharge, where is it going in the system? How do we clean it? Where, is it? where can we stop it so it doesn't continue through the system? But now we also have to map all of our known outfalls with not only the location but the size and type of pipe. We also have to map private systems and where they connect into our public system. So I was able to show them that we do have a spreadsheet that has all of our information that we've collected so far on our outfalls, but I worked with our um, GIS group to map out the outfalls that still need some information gathered. So as our public works crews are out doing work in those areas, they know which ones they can go ahead and collect data from while they're out there doing their regular maintenance and operations. So then we'll have the pipe type and pipe size. So we are working on this and we've identified which ones we need to collect more data on. We also need to uh, map out water quality and flow control facilities. And stormwater is very complicated when it comes to mapping because we have so many different technologies out there and it's constantly changing on different facilities. And so we decided to map it out by um, process, what they do, what, what's their function, do they infiltrate, do they detain water? And that's how we've decided to map it out. So we're working with GIS on that. And then the behavioral change campaign. It's part of our education and outreach, but it's a new mandate within that program where we now have to, to determine a behavioral change that's important to Kent. And we have to say why we have identified that, develop a program, implement the program, collect data on that program to see if it's effective or not and then report that out to Ecology and let them know, is this effective? Is this something we're going to continue to work on? Or do we want to go with a different campaign? We decided to go with the Shut It campaign, which is a regional effort, because we have a lot of dumpsters in Kent, and they leave their lids open. When they do that, um, birds or weather or whatever can cause that litter to come out and enter our system. And also, it allows rain into the, or into the um, dumpsters, which make them leak. And there's always a catch basin right there to receive that polluting water. So this is a behavioral change campaign we're working on and we're collecting data on right now. So other audit topics were public education and outreach, illicit discharge and spill response, controlling runoff from new development and redevelopment, operations and maintenance, annual NPDES report, stormwater management program, the actual document we went through, and then citywide training program to train our internal employees. So the audit conclusion was the city was ready for the audit and we passed. So what's next? Um, Ecology told us that they're staffed up and they've made it a goal within this five-year permit that they want to um, audit every single jurisdiction. And it's more of an in-depth audit. It's two to three days. 
So one day would be site visits of our facilities like our shops, uh, the golf facility, our Vactor site. The other one would, uh, two would be review of permit requirements, all of them, including a deep dive into documentation of programs and a really close look at where we're at with implementing the new programs. Any questions? Any questions from either of my colleagues? No questions. You have a comment though. Oh, I had, uh, did you say you did have a comment? I have a comment, so is this the conclusion? Yes, this is okay. the conclusion. So I just wanted to tell you that every time you come speak about stormwater, I, I like, never seems like it's gonna be a very glamorous topic, but you always make it so interesting. <laughs> I actually really enjoy your presentation, so I just wanna thank you for the time and effort you thank put you. into that, because you make them very accessible and, and engaging. Well, good, I appreciate that. So we've heard how, before how many man help covers or how many traffic lights. Do you know how many outfalls we have? Not on, by, not on hand here, but I do have um, a spreadsheet that has them all, so I, c I could look that up for you and get that information to you. Thank you. Yep, no problem. And then you mentioned team up to clean up. I think we have another event coming up here for recycling, not for cleaning up. But if somebody is interested in cleaning up, because that happens twice a year, you can always contact Public Works, I believe, to be able to do a neighborhood or to adopt a street or to, uh, call them, tell them the area that you're interested in and they can certainly set you up to make sure that that area is set up for you and cleaned by you and we definitely appreciate it. But there's on the 16th, Saturday the 16th, the fall residential recycling event where you can put, not where they can, they have a week and they can put there or these two different ones. We have coming up when, uh, Republic will be will allow people to put extra out on their curbside and then you can there's no extra charge for that but time to clean out your garage and get that taken away up for free. Would you like to add something? Clean up for yard waste. Uh, curbside yard waste. Curbs. And, yeah, and then of course uh, a cleanup event where you haul your stuff to uh, Hogan Field for removal for recycling separate event and we'll have the dates post on the website thank you very much thank you thank you so if there is nothing else for the good of the order our meeting is adjourned thanks thank you